It's the first televised debate for a crucial U.S. Senate race. Maryland, who would have thought it, could be the pivotal state. Congressman David Trump and Prince George's County Executive Angela Alsobrooks talk about matters important to you. We have to invest in people. I've already voted already once in the Congress uh, to codify Roe. Uh, v. Wade. Fox 45 News, the Baltimore Sun, and the University of Baltimore Schaefer Center for Public Policy Center present the Maryland U.S. Senate Candidate Forum. This is your voice, your future. Well, good evening and welcome to your voice, your future Maryland U.S. Senate Candidate Forum. I'm Kai Jackson. Now, in preparing this forum, both campaigns agreed to no opening statements. The debate topics include the economy, budget, foreign affairs, crime and law enforcement, education and reproductive rights. All questions are directed to both candidates and they have one minute to answer and then 30 seconds for rebuttals. A coin flip determined who gets the first question and who goes first in closing statements. You can see that coin flip on foxbaltimore.com. Well, joining me today, my colleague at Fox 45, Mackenzie Frost, the Baltimore Sun's Jeff Barker, and the University of Baltimore Schaefer Center's Dean Roger Hartley. They're our debate panel who will ask the questions this evening. Well, most importantly, allow me to introduce the candidates tonight, Prince George's County Executive Angela Alsobrooks and Congressman from the 5th District of Maryland, David Trone. Thank you both for being here. Candidates, are you, oh, wonderful. Candidates, are you ready? Okay. All right, well, let's get started. Well, first of all, my first question, and I drew the first question tonight, the homicide rate in Baltimore declined this year, uh, but there was a mass shooting at a block party and a multiple victim shooting near Edmonds and Westside High School. And just today in Greenbelt, Prince George's County, your home county, uh, Ms. Also Brooks, several juveniles were involved in a shooting. Our question tonight, what would you do about the crime Marylanders are facing and Baltimoreans are facing? Again, this question for both of you. First of all, Mr. Trone, you. please, first. Yep. First of all, thank you for that crime. I mean, with crime, we've got to hold folks accountable. I mean, that's step number one, accountability. But on top of that, we've got to look at the roots of what crime is, and that's poverty, poverty, poverty. And the ex solutions of that are education. We've got to get folks the education they need, age three, full-day kindergarten, full-day full day school, full-day pre-K at age four, and then right on up. But that's the key of that, and then, of course, getting jobs. If we don't have folks a job, 75% recidivate. If they have a job, that recidivism's 8%. There's 2.3 million folks right now incarcerated. 95%, they're coming out. So that means if we can get them a job, we literally save almost 2 million crimes. My company, Total Wine & More, we've hired over 1,400 returning citizens. It's about a job. Ms. Also Brooks? Well, you know, first of all, tonight I can only imagine what the parents are feeling um, of these students who were just trying to enjoy um, their activities leading up to their, to their graduation and their prom. I'm a mother of an 18-year-old daughter who last year at this same exact time uh, wanted to enjoy the final days of her senior year, and they should have felt safe and actually should have been safe today. Uh, not only in Baltimore and Prince George's, but all across our state. Every child deserves to be safe in the communities in which they live. I have dedicated uh, my life, really, to making sure uh, that families have safe places to live. This is how I came into public service in the first place as state's attorney. Um, I have invested in the youth of Prince George's County, funding our school systems at the highest rate we've seen in the history of the county, investing in mental health care, summer programming, summer jobs, making sure that their families have affordable places to live. But we also do have to hold our children accountable. We have to get these guns off the street. I will do so as a senator. Really getting conscientious and sensi sensible gun legislation is necessary. We've got to get the guns off our streets. All right, that is our time right now. And do we have any rebuttals? We also need to think about those young folks that are 12, 14, 16 years of age. Where do they go exactly sometimes? If they have a place to go to study, to be mentored, to have a chance to maybe play computer games, play basketball, kickball, whatever, we need to have those rec centers, those boys and girls type YMCA places. We're able to build one in Frederick. I built one in Hagerstown. We built one in Cumberland. We built one in Oakland. So throughout our district, we brought community project funding home to give our youth a place to go. Ms. Also Brooks? 
you know, the act of keeping children safe uh, is the government has a role to play, but our families have an outsized role to play in keeping our children safe. It's why as county executive, um, I imposed a curfew and enforced that curfew uh, two years ago when I realized that the predominance of violence was happening between 10 p.m. and 5 a.m. Every one of us in our communities has a, a role to play. It means families, it means communities, it means our faith centers all have a, play, a role to play in keeping our youth safe. The government can do its role, but we as a community have a role to play in keeping our kids safe. All right, that's our time, Ms. Also Brooks. We're gonna go to our second question. This is going to be from Mackenzie Frost and it will be directed to Ms. Also Brooks. Mackenzie. Thanks, Kai. Baltimore City is suing the ATF to get gun trace data that is currently prohibited from being shared publicly due to some amendments that have been attached to DOJ appropriation bills for years. We know that Mayor Brandon Scott is suing the ATF. If elected, would you support repealing or loosening that regulation to provide that data to the public so the cities can get that information? You know, I think I agree with Brandon, with uh, Mayor Scott, um, that we have really got to make sure that we have all the information we need to solve crimes. Um, I think the federal government certainly has a role to play, and I can tell you this much. Uh, we have seen too many games played um, in Congress. You know, we have to make sure these Republicans who have at every turn uh, really made it difficult um, to, again, get sensible gun legislation, uh, making sure that we have the ability not only to trace weapons, but to get ghost guns off our streets. We have to make sure that we're closing up gun loopholes. We have to make sure we're getting these uh, AR-15s off of our streets. And in order to do that, we are going to have to hold the Senate in Democratic hands. Uh, this, there is so much at stake in this election, and if we allow for any reason the Senate of the United States to be in the hands of these Republicans, I can tell you that they will continue to block what is sensible uh, in terms of guns. And again, we are seeing epidemic numbers where gun violence is concerned, and we have to do more. And I agree with Mayor Scott that we've got to get that information. That's our time. It's also Brooks. Mr. Trump. Yeah, no, there's no question we've got to support uh, municipalities and getting the information so we can track and follow up on these weapons. And we voted last session in Congress to do a complete ban on all assault weapons. And we must have a ban on assault weapons. These are weapons that are made to take lives. There's no hunting involved here. It's taking lives. They have to be banned. But to get all this done, you know, we've got to be bipartisan. And that's what I've worked really hard on my entire three terms in Congress, is how I build that bipartisan connectivity with the other side. I'm a progressive Democrat, but let's say if we don't get 10 votes in the U.S. Senate on each one of these pieces of legislation, and we can do that on moving the gun safety bills forward, we can never get anything passed. I'm good at getting that done. I was ranked the fourth, four out of 535 most bipartisan member of Congress. That's a big deal to help us win. That's your time. Ms. Also, Brooks, your rebuttal. You know, I, I started my career as a domestic violence prosecutor, uh, working to make sure that we kept all of our communities safe. Um, but we've had the real, the great luck of, of having Maryland as a leader. I worked uh, in 2012 uh, as a part of the group that worked on the Firearms Safety Act in Maryland. And so Maryland really has been a leader uh, in terms of uh, really passing sensible gun legislation. Um, I'll continue that in the Senate, making sure that I am working to, to not only have uh, gun legislation in Maryland, but throughout our country as well. All right. And rebuttal. And, of course, the problem with gun legislation at the end of the day is special interest money. The NRA has been giving hundreds of millions of dollars. You know, in the last two-year cycle, $1.9 billion of special interest money came into our country into the Congress, into the House, $1.9 billion. That's what we have to stop. The special interests, they're the ones that are out there saying, let's not make these changes. Well, we've got to push back and get this special interest money out of politics. Thank you very much. We're going to go to our next question now. Uh, this will go to, this will be from Roger Hartley to Mr. Trone. Mr. Hartley. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, this one has a little bit of a wind-up, and it's an uh, education question. Uh, the federal government sends millions of tax dollars to local jurisdictions for education annually. In Baltimore City, there have been several examples of performance concerns and a lack of oversight for some grades. Uh, what oversight parameters would you like to see implemented at the federal level to help foster better outcomes for students in our classrooms? 
At the end of the day, I think we all realize that we're not winning as much as we like to win in education. If we get education right, that's really the key thing we can do is take care of our kids and our grandchildren. If they've got that educational founding that's solid, they're going to succeed. So we've got to get more dollars to help those with special needs, first of all. I was endorsed by the teachers' union, 75,000 strong. We're very appreciative of that. We need more teachers. We need better pay, better pay for our teachers, and we need respect for our teachers. But at that same time, we need to fund the special needs programs. The federal government said, do this for special needs children, and we'll give you 40% of the cost. The best we've ever done is 14%. So we need to bridge that divide. That's roughly $26 billion plus drive mental health money there. We have $3 billion on the way that we voted for to support K-12 through mental health. All right. Thank you very much, Ms. Also Brooks. You know, I was, I was raised by two incredible parents um, who did not have the opportunity to go to college, but the one thing that they taught me is that education is the great equalizer in our country and that every child deserves to have a quality education. One of the things that I've learned uh, as, a, as an executive, however, is that your zip code very often determines the quality of your education. So I will ensure as a senator that every child, without respect for your zip code, has a quality education by funding Title I funding, making sure uh, that we invest in the Individuals with Disabilities and Education Act so that our children with disabilities are also able to have a sound education. As county executive, I've funded education at the highest levels we've seen in our county. Over 62% of our budget goes to education. I think all of us have a role to make sure that those dollars actually meet the children where they need them in the classroom, make sure that we have quality teachers standing in front of our students who are well paid, and making sure that those dollars go to uh, mental health education, and making sure that all of our students have exactly what they need to succeed. Congressman Trone, rebuttal? Yeah. I'm the uh, student of a public school teacher, a son of a public school teacher, and my wife and I all attended public schools, and that's the backbone of the American education system. So we've got to be there to support that day in and day out. But one thing we need is more teachers that look like the students, and that's where immigration comes into this. By reforming our immigration policies, we can get more teachers from El Salvador, Haiti, Ghana, all kinds of different places around the world that look like the students so they can succeed together. County Executive also, Brooks. You know, one of the things I've come to understand, uh, especially as an executive, is that a child's success in the classroom requires that we not only invest in that child in the classroom, but at home, making sure they have affordable places to live, making sure that their parents have the kind of jobs that pay them a wage so that they can sit home in the evening and do homework with their kids. We got to bring down the cost of living for so many of our families as well to make sure that our families are able to spend time with their children. And so it is that we have to invest in our kids in the classroom and also in the communities where they live in order for them to be successful. Okay, thank you very much. Our next question will be asked by Jeff Barker. Yeah, as, uh, as a state's attorney, uh, county executive also Brooks sought the death penalty in a 2011 case uh, involving the conviction of a man uh, for killing four people, including two young children. As you know, the, the federal government is considering, or, or rather members of Congress are considering seeking a repeal of the federal death penalty. Would you support such a repeal? So, you know, what I can tell you is that Marylanders have um, spoken and they have decided that the death penalty is no longer the law of the land in Maryland, and I agree with Maryland voters. Um, I can tell you that I would also not support uh, the death penalty on the federal level. Um, I can tell you, having said that, what I believe is that anyone who harms a child or who murders a child in particular deserves the stiffest penalty uh, available to that person. Uh, and right now in Maryland, that penalty is life without parole. Um, that's what I saw in the case that you mentioned, the case that involved two young children who were executed, two and three years old. Um, but I can tell you that in that case, um, I sought life without parole because, again, I believe that people who harm and murder children deserve the st stiffest penalty possible, uh, but I would not be uh, supporting the death penalty on the federal level. Congressman Trone, the same question for you. I'm the only candidate on the stage that's uh, always been 100% opposed to the death penalty. We know the death penalty is racist. It feeds our systemically racist system that we have in the criminal justice area. There have been hundreds and hundreds of folks exonerated by DNA evidence later on 
that were put to the death penalty and were saved. Think about the hundreds of others that were not so lucky and were not saved. So we can never have the death penalty. It's clearly cruel and unusual punishment, and it's clearly racist. We work really hard in this area. Um, one of my biggest areas I work on and philanthropically is with the American Civil Liberties Union, the ACLU. We gave my wife and I, through our foundation, gave the ASU $20 million to set up the Trone Center for Justice and Equality. We have 45 lawyers who work in New York City and all around the country to fix our criminal justice system that is so broken and so racially biased. Rebuttal for County Executive also, Brooks. You know, I think it's, it's true that sometimes it's easier to discuss a problem than to repair it. I'm the only person in this race who has had the awesome responsibility of keeping our community safe. And I can tell you that I did so without apology to work to keep the families of our community safe. I have had to hold mothers who lost young children, uh, and I have had to hold us. Uh, 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 husbands who have lost their wives. And so I can tell you that these are not easy cases. I do not support the death penalty. Um, life without parole is that penalty. But again, I make no apology for keeping our community safe. That's your time. Rebuttal for Congressman Trone. It's really important also to remember that uh, our police have a tough job to do, a real tough job. And we have to invest in them to help them do their job more successfully. Uh, last Congress, we passed a bill with Karen Bass and myself put in $124 million to invest in police to learn about mental illness and mental health challenges. So when they go in a door, they can understand that this is not violence. Violence is not needed. It's a mental health issue. So they can make the right decision and save lives. All right. Our next question will come from Mackenzie Frost, and this will be for Congressman Trone. Both of you have made similar comments about abortion rights and access, but now the conversation seems to be turning to the future of in vitro fertilization or IVF. Do you believe the federal government has a role in regulating IVF nationally? And if so, how would you work with other members in the Senate to get your view accomplished? Uh, there's no role for the federal government to moderate and regulate a woman's, woman's health choices. These are the choice between a woman and her doctor, and no one else should be involved in that. Certainly no person in the political specter. Absolutely not. So we've got to work instead, uh, instead to open up freedom so people have that choice, and we can get Roe v. Wade recodified as the law of the land. I mean, that was a horrible, horrible mistake. We saw the price we paid electing Donald Trump. Um, I've already voted to codify Roe v. Wade. I have 100% record from Planned Parenthood, 100% record from NARAL. As a matter of fact, in West, West Virginia, we've had many abortion clinics close. As a matter of fact, 66 have closed in 15 states. Through our foundation, we helped open up a new abortion clinic in Cumberland, Maryland, so folks in deep red Allegheny County can have the right to an abortion safely. County Executive also, Brooks. Well, I can tell you that this issue is a very personal one to me. Um, as the mother of an 18-year-old daughter, I believe so firmly that the privacy and freedom that women deserve to make their own decisions about their bodies are, belong to a woman and a woman only. Um, it is so outrageous that we are at a time where it is not only abortion rights that are under attack, but we see now that these Republicans just won't stop. Their reproductive rights are on the ballot. That we see also when we see IVF, we see uh, that in Arizona now we have Republicans who want to charge a woman with a crime and incarcerate her for making decisions about her own body. So I, on my first day as a senator, will co-sponsor the Women's Health Protection Act to codify in federal law a woman's right to make her own decisions about her body. That decision does not belong to anyone except that woman, but we are now passing on to our daughters uh, a world where they have fewer rights than their mothers and grandmothers. This is wrong. I will fight it at every turn. Women deserve to choose abortion rights, reproductive rights, IVF, it all belongs to the woman. That's the time. Thank you. Rebuttal for Congressman Trone. Uh, as a dad with three daughters, I'm always going to be there with Planned Parenthood 100 percent. I'm the only member on the stage that's supported every single request, every request that Planned Parenthood has made for us to stand with them as they've gone through their journey of trying to bring us back to where we need to be. We need to constitutionalize in the Maryland Constitution Roe v. Wade and a woman's right to have an abortion. 
At the same time, we also have to support our LGBTQ community because they're now under attack also. The attacks are not slowing down. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Also Brooks. Well, I want to make sure the record is clear here. Mr. Trone has given hundreds of thousands of dollars to the most radical Republicans who have passed the most restrictive abortion laws in our country. And he's done this in his personal capacity. On top of that, he's given hundreds of thousands of dollars uh, from, through his company to these Republicans in Texas, Greg Abbott, Ken Paxton, the Attorney General, Brian Kemp in Georgia. And so he cannot claim credit for the good his company does and distance himself from the bad that it does. Okay. Our next question is going to come from Jeff Barker, and this will be directed to County Executive also, Brooks. Yes. Uh, in a new poll from the Baltimore Sun and Fox 45 News and the University of Baltimore, 57 percent of respondents said they supported an immediate ceasefire in Gaza. Do you believe there could be a ceasefire while Hamas continues to operate militarily? And what other conditions do you think should be imposed for a ceasefire to occur? Well, let's just first step back and recognize that we are six months away uh, from the horrific attack that occurred on October 7th. Um, and what we all agree is that the threat of Hamas must be removed from the world. Um, I believe that we ought to also make sure we're getting those hostages back home to their families who are waiting for them. We have to go to a, an immediate ceasefire. And we have to make sure that we, the United States, and every other body across the world are doing everything in our power to make sure that we're getting aid into Gaza uh, for the starvation that is happening, making sure that those who uh, are suffering and who are sick in Gaza get the aid that they need. We also must make sure that we are stopping the, the, the uh, killing of innocent civilians uh, in, the, in Gaza, um, as well as making sure that we're moving toward a two-state solution. Uh, security and peace for Israelis, security, peace, and self-determination uh, for the Gazans who are in, in uh, Palestine, um, for the Palestinians who are in Gaza, uh, two, two states for two people. Congressman Trone. Uh, we've always been a very strong supporter of Israel. I'm Lutheran. Uh, my wife and four children are all Jewish. We've stood with Israel, our most important ally in the Middle East, the only democracy in the Middle East. And we need to continue to stand with Israel. What happened on October the 7th, it was incomprehensible. I've seen the videos, the classified videos, and some of those images are, are they're seared in my mind. I cannot get them out. I met with a young woman uh, who had been a hostage, and she, she, she could hardly, she couldn't really speak to what she had endured. And we, we've got to be there to destroy Hamas. Hamas, the terrorist organization, he must be destroyed. But that said, we've got to get to a ceasefire with the hostages, 100% of them released simultaneously. These two things can only happen and only happen together at one time. The rebuttal for county executive also, Brooks. Again, you know, I, I agree that we, first of all, have to make sure that we're getting the hostages home to their families. Um, I've been seeing many of them on the news who have gone to the Knesset who are um, understandably just so um, grief-stricken waiting for their family members to come home. And we have to move to a ceasefire. We also have to make sure, and again, this is the responsibility of all of us, that we are uh, really abating the, the humanitarian crisis that is developing every day in Gaza and that we are stopping the killing, the innocent killing of, civ of innocent civilians. Rebuttal for Congressman Trump. Well, certainly we need to get to a two-state solution, and we will get to that. But uh, tomorrow, I'm excited. We're going to be voting tomorrow. Tomorrow, we're going to pass the bill to bring aid to Israel. There'll be $26 billion of aid to Israel, and it'll be bipartisan. And that's what I do best. I work bipartisan. I work across the party lines. But we're also going to have $9 billion of aid to help rebuild Gaza. Those folks deserve a job, a future, and hope. They have hope. We will not have Hamas. All right, thank you. Much more to come. Stay with us. Our Maryland U.S. Senate Candidate Forum will continue right after the break.
And welcome back. Our candidate forum continues tonight. I'm Kai Jackson with my colleagues. I have the next question for our candidates. And the question tonight is, what approach should the United States take with Israel to try to prevent further escalation from happening in the conflict between Iran and Israel as both have laid strikes upon each other? And this one goes to County Executive also Brooks first. So, you know, it is, um, first of all, when Donald Trump was president, um, he really did make a mockery of the United States as a leader. Um, I am really proud that President Joe Biden um, has made America a leader again. Um, in saying so, we have allies. Uh, Israel is an ally of the United States, as are Ukraine uh, and others, Taiwan. Um, and so in this moment, I think it is really important, as we see what happened post-October 7th, uh, we have stood with, with Israel as our ally. Um, and we watched recently when we had uh, Iran, I noticed that there was, um, when, when we had the, um, the missiles uh, from our Iran and Israel, um, I'm proud that President Biden did urge restraint uh, under those circumstances, and I think he did the right thing in it. Um, I think what we do not want is to see a widening of the conflict in the Middle East. Um, and so I agree with President Biden's approach. Uh, to urge restraint, and thankfully, it looks uh, like this happened, and, I, and I, I'm encouraged by it. Congressman Trone? Well, first of all, we have to really stand strong with Israel. We've got to be there for Israel. They've been attacked relentlessly by Iran. America did the right thing. Joe Biden has been fantastic, but we need to continue that resolve to stay there and support Israel. Secondarily, I've traveled to Israel many, many times. I've been to Gaza. I've been to the West Bank repeatedly. I met with Prime Minister Abbas. We even met Arafat many years ago. So I've been a regular constant presence in the foreign policy area. And quite frankly, it's going to take the Arab nations to work together. I'm co-chairman of the Abraham Accords Caucus. There's two Democrats, me and Brad Snyder from Chicago, two Republicans. Once again, it's bipartisan, how we work together, how we say, let's get this done as an American team, not just a Democratic or Republican team. The support for Israel has to be American, and that's what we're going to do in the Abraham Accords Caucus. Okay, rebuttal for County Executive also, Brooks. You know, again, it is the case that, um, that Israel is an ally of the United States. Um, I think the United States has stood with Israel. Israel has a right to defend itself. Um, and I support the relationship between Israel and the United States. Um, and I am proud that President Biden, in this moment, um, has urged that we should, again, um, ensure that we are not widening the conflict. What we want to do is to bring down the temperature um, in the Middle East. Um, I think that is very important to make sure that we are not seeing uh, civilian lives lost uh, while Israel defends itself. Rebuttal for Congressman Trone. And the Abraham's Accords Caucus, we've been meeting with all the ambassadors from the Arab countries. We've met, with, of course, the Israeli ambassador multiple times. And we're working to get ways where we can connect the people of the Arab countries with Israel. Things like tourism. We've had over 2 million tourists now going between UAE and the other Abraham Accords countries and Israel, bringing people together, bringing people together with business, business to business relationships. This is how we build a stable Middle East, is connectivity. Thank you. Our next question will come from Mackenzie Frost, and this will go to Congressman Trone. Thank you, Kai. The key bridge collapse really highlighted the stressors that we have seen put on the infrastructure and transportation system in the Baltimore region when it comes to some of the traffic backups, as well as other conversations about public transportation. What's the federal government's role in the larger conversation when it comes to public transit? And how would you ensure accountability and oversight for the federal dollars that would be coming to regions like Baltimore City to ensure that the projects don't balloon and we actually Actually see results? Well, first of all, we have to recognize and pay respect uh, to the six workers that lost their lives uh, from Mexico, from Honduras, from El Salvador, from Guatemala. They've lost their lives working on a tough shift, a night shift, at a tough job, and often we demonize immigrants. But these folks are some of the greatest Americans that are working really hard for our country day, in this case, night. So their loss, we have to recognize. Then we got to support the longshoremen and all the other folks that are there working have lost their jobs. They've got no job. Boom, zero, 
gone. We've got to get them full pay. Unemployment of $430 a week is not enough. We've got to get them back to what their pay was prior to this. Then, of course, we've got to get this bridge built as quickly as we can. And we've got to be focused on that. I'm an appropriator on the Appropriations Committee. We're going to get the money. We're going to make that happen. And we're going to use project labor agreements to make it happen with union labor. That's time. County Executive also Brooks. You know, I think we never can lose sight of the fact that this uh, bridge collapse started with the tragedy, uh, the tragedy of the six lives that were lost. Um, I was happy to uh, right away deploy our divers who uh, went to the, to the uh, scene. Um, and I spoke with Governor Wes Moore, spoke with the, um, reached out also to the mayor of Baltimore as well as the county executive of Baltimore. Uh, and we were able to assist in the efforts there uh, to recover the uh, individuals who lost their lives. Uh, what I can tell you is in rebuilding that bridge, it's going to be very important um, to not only get the infrastructure dollars that are going to be necessary to build the bridge, uh, but to make sure that we are securing the jobs of the 15,000 individuals who have been impacted, as well as getting small business loans to the businesses who have been impacted. Listen, I'm the only person in this race who has the experience of not voting is just one part. Um, there are people in Washington who think voting is all of it. But I've been able to not only get the funding, but to turn that funding into real infrastructure. I have built schools. I have built hospitals. I've built roads. Uh, and it's important to implement the funding even after you get it. Rebuttal for Congressman Trone. Uh, as an appropriator, we built all of the above. But I want to first also thank Governor Wes Moore. He's done a spectacular job of being the quarterback, being the leader, being there every day on the spot, advocating to get this project moving, moving right, getting it done. So I want to say thank you to Governor Moore. But also, we've got to work at these big transit projects like we have here, the Red Line. Larry Hogan took $900 million from Baltimore, said, Baltimore, you don't need the money. You don't need good public transit. That's wrong. A rebuttal for County Executive also, Brooks. You know, I, too, want to compliment Governor Moore, Congressman Mfume, and uh, Senator Van Hollen, and to say I'm really proud uh, to have all of their endorsements uh, in this race. They are supporting me. Um, and I agree that when we get the infrastructure dollars uh, to rebuild this bridge, it is most important that those dollars circulate in Baltimore City. We want the people of Baltimore City to benefit, to have union labor, to be able to have the jobs there, to make sure the businesses and small businesses, minority businesses benefit uh, from the dollars that come to Baltimore City. As we re rebuild, we also should be investing in the economy in Baltimore City. That's the time. Our next question will come from Jeff Barker, and this will be directed to County Executive also Brooks. Yes. Um, as you know, Congressman Trone has the ability to largely self-fund his campaign, which has given him an advantage uh, in campaign spending and media buys. W would you favor a proposal in which small donations uh, could be matched by the federal government to even the playing field in future elections? So what, we, what we've seen in this race before, first of all, I'm, I am so grateful um, to have the support of a very broad coalition across the state of Maryland. Uh, that coalition involves people like Governor Moore and, of course, uh, again, Senator Van Hollen, Congressman Hoyer, Congressman Jamie Raskins, uh, so many others, uh, uh, Delegate Stephanie Smith, who is here with us tonight, so many. Um, I'm also proud to be supported by Marylanders who have contributed to my campaign. Over thousands of people have contributed to our campaign. Having said that, what we have seen in this race before, uh, having spent over $45 million of self-funding, uh, the highest ever in history, I don't believe this is the way democracy works. Um, I think that we should have uh, reform in these, in these campaigns. That's the reason I'm pleased to have been endorsed by End Citizens United. We got to get uh, the, the big money out of campaigns. Um, and I would support um, that kind of reform as a senator because, again, these campaigns should be about people. It should not be about money. Congressman Trone. Well, first, I want to mention uh, the entire Democratic leadership in Congress. Hakeem Jeffries, Catherine Clark, Pete Aguilar, the entire leadership endorses us and supports us because they understand we get stuff done. We get stuff over the finish line. 26 bills passed last time just on addiction and mental health alone, plus Pell Grant bills to help returning citizens. But we've got to get the money out of the politics that's really poisoning our system. And I'm the only candidate on this stage that doesn't take money from Exxon. They're not helping us in the environment, I don't think. I'm the only candidate here that doesn't take money from Pfizer. Pfizer's not helping us bring drug costs down. I'm the only candidate that doesn't take money from Cigna. 
I know how difficult they are when I try and make mental health claims. And of course, he only doesn't take money from the National Restaurant Association, who wants to pay our waiters and waitresses $3.65 an hour. That's wrong. That needs to be 15 plus tips. Rebuttal for County Executive also Brooks. You know, again, I think it's important first to point out that six of our seven, seven congressional members, all of Mr. Trone's colleagues, have endorsed me in this race. I'm proud of that. But I think it's also, I want to just mention again, hundreds of thousands of dollars that Mr. Trone has spent on these radical Republicans who want to not only um, to ban abortion, uh, who want also, who are anti-union, but also to defeat good, good Democratic candidates. He supported Greg Abbott of Texas, uh, Ken Paxton of Texas. He, is, he has spent hundreds of thousands of dollars to defeat good Democratic candidates. Rebuttal for Congressman Trone. I think it's really important for folks to think about who supports who. I guess the folks that really matter the most are those that know you the best, that know you the best. Well, the folks that know folks the best, they're the ones in Prince George County. Eight years, Anthony Brown, now the Attorney General from Prince George County, supports us. Joanne Benson, the longest serving state senator in Prince George County, supports us. Aisha Brayboy, the state's attorney, Prince George County, supports us. The list goes on and on and on, all with us. All right, that's time. We have to keep moving. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question is going to come from Roger Hartley, and this will be directed to Congressman Trone. Thank you, Kai. Uh, this race is now being watched nationally. Um, electability is going to be in the key um, in the minds of voters for this election, and, uh, and that's because the control of the Senate is on the line. Um, what makes you more electable than your opponent? So first of all, thank you for that. Um, you know, what I have to say that, is... That should be for Congressman I'm sorry. Trump, I believe. That's okay. okay. Yep, we're a little... Uh, Roger, thank you for that uh, question. I appreciate it. And electability, that's absolutely the key. And there is no question, every single poll has said the same thing. I'm the more candidate, I'm the candidate that can beat Larry Hogan. Not one poll has said anything different. Everyone says, I can beat Hogan. Not one poll has ever said my opponent can beat Larry Hogan, because she won't. I have the resources to beat Larry Hogan. And I have the, the persona to win across this state, to win in the Eastern Shore, to win in Southern Maryland, to win big in Western Maryland. All these different areas are 31% of the vote total. They add up. At the same time, we'll deliver the votes in Prince George's County and Montgomery County with great surrogates like Hakeem Jeffries, Jim Clyburn, Wes Moore. All those folks will be here to drive voter turnout. We'll beat Larry Hogan. It's going to be a battle. We have to beat Larry Hogan, and I can do that and will do that. County Executive also Brooks. Well, you know, I, what, what we do know the polls are showing is that after $45 million uh, have been spent in this race to defeat me, we are within a statistical tie in this race, that we are tied in this race with a large number of undecided voters. We have a broad and growing coalition across the state of Maryland that I'm so proud of. That coalition, again, includes over 90, 190 people uh, throughout the, elected throughout the state of Maryland, uh, people uh, like uh, Congressman Raskins and, and, uh, and people like uh, Congressman Mfume and Speaker of the House Adrian Jones and many, many others. At the end of it, the people will decide this race, not money. Uh, and what I know is that the broad coalition of people that we have developed all across the state, uh, who include young voters, who include women voters, and who include so many others, are what is needed to defeat Larry Hogan in this race. This race will be decided by the people, uh, by the many, and not by the money. That is what I know, is that you can buy, money can't buy you love, and it really cannot buy you Maryland. That's the time. And a uh, rebuttal for Congressman Trone. Uh, the political insiders all thought this would be a coronation. It's not. I've been the underdog, the underdog from day one. We've been out there trying to get our message out. This election's about ideas. Who has good ideas and who shows up all the time? Who does the work? That's my strength. Work, work, getting the job done. I'm ranked the most effective number in the Maryland legis delegation by a factor of three, three times more effective than the number two member. That's getting stuff done. Rebuttal for County Executive also, Brooks. Well, you know, I think it's really interesting um, that Mr. Trone says he's the person who can take on Larry Hogan and beat him, when not so long ago, he was a Larry Hogan donor. 
really funding, uh, funding, providing him the funding he needed to carry his, across his agenda, which I might remind you included restricting abortion care in the state of Maryland. So I believe that we do what we don't need um, is a Larry Hogan donor trying to take on Larry Hogan in the fall. Okay. Our next question. Thank you. Our next question will come from Mackenzie Frost. This will be directed to you, County Executive Also Brooks. Thanks, Guy. Emily's List recently issued a statement regarding Congressman Trones about gender diversity and representation in Congress. The U.S. Census says Maryland's population is 51 percent female. Do you believe the state's congressional delegation should look more like the people who elected them? You know, we, we've had really distinguished uh, representation in Maryland, and included in that representation was a super bad Senator Barbara Mikulski. Um, Gladys Noon Spellman, Connie Morella, we have had women in our delegation. It is the fact now that out of our 10-person delegation, all 10 of them are men. I believe that every one of us ought to be able to look in the Senate of the United States and see themselves, of every race, of every gender, and every background, because it makes our policy stronger. And so I believe it is the case that electing women is not only good for Mar Maryland, Electing women is good for America. It makes our policies more complete, and I think it really is very important um, to have women elected in our delegation who have represented us so ably and, and have brought to bear the perspectives of wives and mothers and sisters and aunts. I believe it is most important when we talk about child care, when we talk about pre-K education, when we talk about a woman's right to choose, we ought to have a woman at the table as those decisions are made. Congressman Trone. One of the biggest things that distinguishes our candidacy, my candidacy, is that I'm not a politician. I'm not a career politician. This goes from one job to the next job to the next job. I'm a public servant. I'm here to work for the folks of Maryland, to get Maryland a better state, have a better country across the aisle. So, yes, I've supported many, many great diversity candidates and will continue to do so across the country, like Lucy McBath in Georgia, Lauren Underwood in Illinois. Matter of fact, in the last couple decades, I've given over $20 million to Democrats at the federal level. I'm the largest donor to Democrats in the last three cycles. I drive our Democratic Party, not only in the House, but also in the Senate. And that's why I'm so effective, because I've got all those connections in the Senate, and I go across party lines. That's the key. Rebuttal for County Executive also Brooks. You know, and I'm, I'm really proud um, to have the support of so many who are already in the Senate, people like Senator Gillibrand, really proud to have Senator Patty Murray, uh, really proud to have Joyce Beatty and so many others who are already uh, in Congress who have supported my candidacy. And you mentioned Emily's List. I'm really proud to have the endorsement of Emily's List as well, as well as um, a, a reproductive rights, a reproductive freedom for all. Um, and so this race is one, again, uh, that is really important that all of our voices are heard. Uh, every one of us ought to have our experience represented in the Senate of the United States. Rebuttal for Congressman Trone. I'll tell you, I'm going to keep going back to what I think really matters, and that's how we get people over politics. People over politics. That's where you ought to be. Public servants, not career politicians. That's the key. And if we don't have them taking the money that $1.9 billion in the last two-year cycle to folks at the federal level, that's the difference maker. When you take the money, you spend 30 percent of your time asking for it, and then they must expect something. They're not charities. That's the time. The next question is going to come from Jeff Barker, and this will be directed to Congressman Schroen. Yeah, Congressman, this one will be short. Uh, do you believe that TikTok uh, presents a national security threat because of its ties to, ties to China, and do you believe TikTok should be banned? Yes. I voted to change the ownership of TikTok, and that's the real issue. TikTok is owned partially by the Chinese government, which gives them insights in through the back door to anyone that has TikTok on their phone. So as a member of Congress, it gets classified briefings on an ongoing basis. That would give them an access to my cell phone and not a good situation. We've got to do what we did already and continue down that road. The new deal is going to give them a year to divest. I think that makes a lot of sense. County Executive also Brooks. You know, I think we ought to be really careful here. I understand that there are um, lots of security risks that we have to really be concerned about. I think we ought to have guardrails in place. I think this should be, we should be careful about who owns uh, TikTok. 
Um, but I am also really in favor of making sure that all of the technologies that we have, um, many of our young people use these technologies um, uh, for, for things that are also good. Um, and so I think we should be really careful as we talk about things like banning TikTok. Uh, but I think we ought to address the safety and security issues and make sure uh, that they're safe. Congressman Trone, rebuttal. I'd just like to jump over to another important piece of a public servant, and that's doing a spectacular job of taking care of the folks in your district. We've really stood out on the best customer service, constituent service in our district, and that's one of the many reasons why we are ranked first and most effective. But also, we brought home the dollars to our district. It's about bringing home the money. Show me the money. Our district brought home the number six numbers out of 212 on community project funding. Six out of 212. That's millions, tens of millions to our district. That's, that's time. Rebuttal for County Executive also, Brooks. You know, I'm really proud to have been yesterday uh, endorsed by the Washington Post, who endorsed me for my effectiveness. Uh, effective, effectiveness as a county executive where I've built the first of its kind cancer center in my county. I have just in the last three years built a broken ground on 10 new schools, opened six of them last fall, and we're breaking ground on another eight this year for 18 new schools in a six-year period for our children. I've built the first of its kind mental health care and addictions care facility so that we care for our loved ones who are sick with addiction and not lock them up, uh, and making sure that we're putting billions of dollars in areas that have been underserved. Our next, thank you. Our next question will come from Dean Roger Hartley, and this will be directed towards County Executive also Brooks. County Executive, um, this is a, a very big question, but a really short one. <laughs> what is your preferred approach to solving the climate change problem? Well, you know, I, first of all, I want to just say that uh, for so many of us, we walked out of our front doors last year and you could smell, smell wildfires uh, as you walked out your door. So what we know about climate is this is not a far, far off um, problem. It is something that we must act on now. It's something that I've acted on as county executive, uh, investing over a billion dollars, for example, in storm water management. We have the first of its kind, uh, the only comp countywide composting program in the state of Maryland. But we have to do more. Building on the in inflation, Redu inflation Reduction Act uh, that, that President Biden has put in place, to make sure that we are incentivizing and, and helping to draw the public into uh, keeping our climate clean, uh, making sure that what we have to do in this moment is to make sure that the communities that need it most, some of our impoverished communities that experience respiratory illnesses uh, and other things, also receive the education and we close the education gap that allows them to learn how to take advantage of the incentives that were put forward by President Biden in the Inflation Reduction Act. Congressman Trone. Um, I'd just like to add a, a little bit of humor. Uh, the Washington Post had a lot of really nice, positive things to say, and I thank them for that. But at the same time, I, I kind of feel like I dodged a bullet. I mean, last race, they got it wrong for governor. They got it wrong for attorney general. They got it wrong for comptroller. So let's hope they can keep their streak up. That said, the Inflation Reduction Act, which President Biden did, $370 billion, is the biggest thing we've ever done to address our climate. This is the most important challenge we've got in our lifetimes. It's always going to be the most important challenge. If we don't get this right, our land, our water, our air, we've got nothing. It's education and it's climate. I've got an A-plus rating with Sierra Club, League of Conservation Voters. We're on all of their projects. We always will be. We don't get this right, we've got no shot. But thank you, President Biden, and we're so happy to vote for the Inflation Reduction Act. The rebuttal goes to County Executive also, Brooks. So the initial investment was great. The $352 billion or so that we invested in the Inflation Reduction Act was fantastic, and we have to do more. Um, again, making sure that we are getting that education uh, to all of our communities to, so that they are able to contribute, making sure that they know about the incentives that are available for electric vehicles, and making sure, again, that we continue to build. There's a whole economy that's at stake in Maryland. We have our farmers and our uh, watermen and others uh, who are impacted by climate. And so it's really important that we uh, do more and more, not only to preserve our uh, climate, but that we are Time. also securing our economy. Congressman Trone, rebuttal. We've got a lot to do to make the Inflation Reduction Act reality. There's a lot of challenge that we have to work together on to get these jobs and skills created to execute on the Inflation Reduction Act. But we need to think out of the box and look at things like how can we work in Africa, Asia, South America, and bring some of our 
clean climate tools for wind, for solar, and bring those all over the world so they can jump past the fossil fuel burning stage of their, their industrial revolution and go right to clean energy. All right, time. Our next question will be coming from Mackenzie Frost, and it will be directed to you, Congressman Trump. We won't have time for rebuttals, so make sure your answers are succinct and please try and answer the question. When it comes to climate change and all of these initiatives that we're seeing from Congress, some, the money has to come from somewhere to fund all of this. So how would you plan to actually fund these priorities and these initiatives without continuing to expand on the national debt and the deficit? Yeah. You have 30 seconds. 30 seconds? 30 seconds, quick. The national debt's $34 trillion. We can't live forever on that. I'm a business guy through and through. I've done business all my life. I get a P&L statement. $200 billion comes back by getting rid of the Trump tax cut for the big companies who are paying an average of 12% in taxes. 12%. You don't pay 12. No one here pays 12. But that's what those big corporations are paying when President Trump made that cut. We need to get things back in like the carried interest loophole. Close that out. We got to go ahead and tax folks for the step up there. We got to step up tax another loophole, all special That's interest your money. At your time, County Executive also, Brooks, you have 30 seconds. I mean, the truth of the matter is that we can't afford not to invest in climate. Again, this is a real and present threat. Walking out your front door, smelling the wildfires, the floods. Uh, we really can't afford not to act on climate. Um, I agree that we're going to have to to make sure we deal with these greedy corporations. Uh, raise the corporate tax rate um, again when the when. Uh, Trump's tax cuts sunset in 2025, I would be in favor of not extending all of those tax cuts, making sure that we slow the growth of government spending. There is legislation to do that, but we're going to have to do both. We're going to have to be able to save the climate and to secure our, our economy. That's our time. Our candidate forum will continue with closing statements right after our break. Stay with us, please. And welcome back to our Your Voice, Your Future, Maryland U.S. Senate debate. Let's begin closing statements. A reminder, each candidate has one minute. We're going to begin with County Executive Angela Alsobrooks. Well, first of all, I want to thank the host for, uh, for hosting us tonight. Certainly want to thank each of you uh, for tuning in. Um, I have really had the great honor of serving in Maryland, my hometown. Um, I was raised here, and I, and I was raised by two incredible parents um, in a working-class family who taught me not only the value of hard work, uh, but taught me what it meant for people to struggle. Um, I've spent the last 27 years in public service because I believe that public service is the highest calling. As state's attorney, I oversaw a 50% cut in violence while I was state's attorney. And as county executive, I have built schools. I have built mental health care facilities. I've invested not only in health care, but in economic opportunity for all of our families, making sure that all of us have the opportunity not only to develop generational wealth, but to have high wages. I will continue to fight for you. I ask you for your vote every single day and every single evening. I know what I'm fighting for. I know who I'm fighting for and what we're fighting about. And I will continue to fight for all of Maryland's families and preserve our democracy. Congressman Trone. It's going to be tough to raise taxes on those big companies when you're taking all their dollars. That's a challenge. My background is I started off on a farm, 200 acres. We had no indoor plumbing. We had an outhouse. At 28, my dad was an abusive alcoholic. Our 
farm failed. We went bankrupt. We lost everything. I started over with my mom and younger siblings and built a business and lived the American dream. I've been so f fortunate, so lucky. Now I have a chance to be a public servant. Public servant and give back. Work in addiction, work in mental health, work in the systemic racism we have in our country, work in education, it's so important, climate change, medical research. But at the same time, I've also been given a second chance as a cancer survivor. I'm still here, and I'm here to be able to make big changes and not owe anybody to make those changes. And I can beat Hogan. I've won in Republican district. My district is Republican plus one. We won by 10 points. That's our time. Thank you, candidates. It's a quick goodbye. Thank you, panel. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I'm Kai Jackson. Have a good night.